Leo Mason, you started out in advertising and went on to become one of the leading photographers of sport in the world. Did your time in the creative world of advertising inform your working practice for the rest of your life? I would say so, yes. Of course, I came from a, from a, from a background of I mean, art school uh, and then going from art school to um, straight into advertising. In those days, advertising, the agencies was very small kind of group of people so we all knew each other you, you learned how to sell you know dramatic pictures dramatic copy and whatever when you got into the photography of sport were you using some of those devices to you know sort of make your pictures different from other people no there wasn't a conscious there wasn't a conscious um, way of doing it like that I, I wasn't really to start with I wasn't really influenced by by uh, the sports photographers per se. I worked on a couple of accounts uh, where we, we were sport orientated. Ford Motor Company, for instance, had a photograph of the Ford cars, not a photograph by the side of the road, but, but, but track them. So I could do things like that. And that led to one thing that's when I got a lot of work advertising for being a motion photographer. So I got a portfolio together uh, and just by chance, and it was by chance, I went off to the Evening Standard one afternoon, went out to show the picture, and said, are you doing anything tonight? <laughs> the classic line, isn't it? He <laughs> said, are you doing anything tonight? I said, no. He said, well, come and do some work for us. I liked that, actually. I have to say, I didn't like it, because I thought, I, I found a platform for what I want to do. This is, this is what I want to do. As I was saying that... Uh, my, my raison d'etre is taking photographs. Would you call yourself a, a, a good technician? No, not particularly. No, no more than the, the photographers beside you? I mean, some photographers are good at the gear, aren't they, and good at... No, it doesn't, doesn't. I mean, I know technically now, of course, because I started, once I started to test myself, push myself hard, and I did that, started, you know, last, say, let's just say last 10 years when when digital got to the stage where there wasn't an awful lot more you could do, I started to shoot a lot of multiple exposure photography, which is technically very difficult, as you know. Um, and then I started to shoot slick camera. Explain that to the viewer. The, the well, slick camera. slick camera photography is probably the most advanced stuff I've ever done. It's basically what it is. It's like a photo finish camera. You have to get an old film camera, which I did, and you have to take the shutter out and put a slit in. So you just got so the, the a narrow, no shutter. A narrow band of light. And then what you do is you put the camera on, on a tripod upside down. And you, and you rewind the film into the cassette. You then wait for your subject to come from left to right as it's coming this way. And then you rewind the film with a manual rewind according to the speed. Where does that come from, that patience, that, that invention for you? I wanted to, to test myself. So are you always pushing yourself? I, I try each year to reinvent, you know, to, because otherwise what happens is that you're, you're shooting the same pictures all the time. During the 80s, you covered the Grand National. And this is one of the days you came up with something different. You wanted to try something different. Tell us about that. Well, yes, of course, uh, I'd shot 
Now, by, that, by this time, I'm shooting a lot of remote camera photography. Remote camera work was something I really enjoyed because, once again, you could technically it was quite challenging and you had to think about what you wanted to say. Show something that nobody would ever have a chance to look at normally under all the circumstances. They wouldn't have the chance to see that. At the chair, I thought I'd like to look down slightly into the chair rather than to the side of the chair, which we normally would do. As you know, it's got a, it's got a, uh, they jump and then they got a, there's a, there's a great white trough they had to get over to get over the thing. Um, and this particular one, there was a terrible crash. One horse um, misjudged it and fell into the trough and brought down five or six others, uh, all of whom were destroyed, I think, had to be destroyed. Um, and um, there's another one of those things that was I found particularly upsetting to see. And I didn't go back for five, six years. By that time, of course, as a direct result of that and some problems they had at the uh, Beaches Brook, mm -hmm. um, they modified so that, because nobody wanted to see that. It's a very brave thing to do on the chair because you only get one go at it. And you only get one go at the, the national per year, don't you? So you, you've gone for broke on this idea. And can you remember what equipment you were using? Well, yeah, I would have been using Nikon, I think, then. Nikon. You attached your camera to, to the chair with your clamps your, your, that you've invented. But how do you fire the camera? Uh, it was infrared, but then it was, uh, it was, it was, a, uh, it was a wireless. So you had a, a little thing you know, that on the top of the hot shoe, and you fired it like this, that kind of thing. Had a range of about... Uh, 20 meters maybe. Tell us a bit about the America's Cup. You, you know, you've had some great successes there and tragedies along the line. Give us a little kind of flavor of what it was like to cover the America's Cup. Well, the America's Cup, of course, I was there in the famous 183 in Newport, Rhode Island, when they lost the America's Cup. And that last race was just something else. Um, it was, it was three all. Last race, this can't be. This is huge. This is, this is the biggest thing that's ever happened. When I hadn't lost in, what, 150 years. When you're talking about sailing, you always like talking about this. Mm -hmm. So you go, this, uh, that, that makes, and that, this one's in this, and mm -hmm. they're like this. And so you can more or less tell, because you're way back. See, mm -hmm. you're back here. And I said, I'm sure Australia is in the lead. So that can't be, surely. Lo and behold, they win. And there's absolute chaos. Absolute chaos. So out of that, of course, came a, you know, I was made. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, How many Olympics have you covered? Well, I've shot 10 Summer Olympics from 76 Montreal, first one I did, to um, London 2012. 10 is enough. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody that you got a lot of photographs from over five Olympics was Redgrave. Yeah, well, well, Steve Redgrave, I got him on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, and it was the Sydney Olympics, I think, wasn't yeah. it? Sydney Olympics. The big picture that was going to be was going to be Redgrave v. one, the five in a row. Yeah. Everybody knew that. But with that day, that final was rammed. You can imagine, you know, guys were there from two o'clock in the morning, camped out on that. As they come out the boat, you know, come up the little ramp there. <laughs> sort of, yeah. the remotes everywhere, you know, everything you could have possibly imagine. So I looked and I thought, what's the point? So I went round the side. And of course, there is the picture with him. Five o'clock in the morning, the telephone rings. Because so, of course it was film. So I just, I just turned the film in. And um, I said, I said uh, you know, is there something wrong? He said, you got the cover. He said, you got the cover. He said, well done. He said, congratulations, you got the cover. Another great success you had at the, the Olympics was in 1980 in Moscow, the great Kohanovit race. Seb loves that picture. How it came about was for the day, because then you remember I was, I was the, the SJA's photo coordinator. Mm -hmm. So we, we didn't have a lot of photographers there, I know. 
half a dozen maybe of that. So I'd, I'd arranged that we all would be on that finish line, head on shot. Uh, and then what happened was that the, the pistol started and a, a, a Russian cameraman came and stood right in front of us with, with a tripod. He just went, Choop! just literally put it down. And we, everyone, and of course there was a, there was going to be a fight, you can imagine, he could care less. So I said, look, I'll quickly ask him, can we put our cameras between his legs, between the tripod? He said, yeah, don't, I don't care. That's what we did. That's how that picture came about. Tell me about your experiences in tennis and the, the big moments for you. Well, uh, I shot 38 Wimbledons, I think. 38? Something like that, Respect, yeah. respect. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I started, uh, when I really started as a pro sports photographer, by this time, by that I mean, I wasn't doing so much advertising anymore, I was doing more editorial. Yeah. It was a way of life for two weeks. I was the most impossible person to be around at that time. I was so focused in on every single day from day one match point yeah, but there's always match points there's match points other matches and you get into that zone of going there you know exactly what you're going to shoot in terms of what matches you're going to shoot and of course you've got to make a decision on whatever the match point is as who you think is going to win and whether the, the guy that lost is going to be a pitcher as well, it, it, it depends on the dynamics of who is on the court. And I got to know all those players in that era because I was on the tour then. Mm -hmm. So one thing led to another. I started and then I did the US Open tennis. Then I did the, all the American big time, you know, Miami. Mm -hmm. There's a circuit that you went round on, you know, sort of. Uh, what I'd really love to know is Borg versus McEnroe. I'd love to know your well, mem yeah. memories of that titanic struggle between those two yeah well th that that is a standout what what is standout about is that four set tie break that's what everybody always remember. i remember it yeah. it was a it was a t monumental power between the two of them uh and after that i had to actually leave my position and walk around the outside to get my thoughts together because it, it was so draining to watch this these two guys it, it, on one side there, you've got this player who gets the ball back, no matter what you do. On the other hand, you've got John McEnroe, who was a great serve and volley player, left-handed. And I thought, this is going to be some finale here. And it was, of course, I ball one in five sets. Um, but Mac had his number then, and he knew it. Now tell me, I want to get you onto another sport while we've got you here. Tell me about uh, Ayrton Senna and the camera setups. Oh, well that... And how it came about, because you, you had to convince people to do this picture. Well, <laughs> I, I was shooting advertising then, of course. I went down to shoot with a, with a TV crew for a commercial, uh, and it was for uh, Marlborough. Marlborough, that's it, Marlborough. Uh, down in Jerez, southern Spain. Um, and I already had the idea to do this. When you're doing a shoot like that, you're all in a room together, pre-shoot. What are we going to do? What are we going to say? Blah, 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 blah. And uh, we're in a garage with Ron Dennis and uh, all that, that uh, senior. And uh, so we go through the, the storyboard to shoot the, the, you know, shoot the commercial. And um, then they the said, well, uh, what, you know, what, what does the stills photographer want to do? I said, well, I want to uh, mount a camera on Ayrton's car and have him go around and fire it. There's a long silence. And I remember thinking, they're trying to think of someone they can kill me. <laughs> <laughs> and Ron Dunner said, are you out of your mind? So off I, off I go, tramp, with, uh, go back to the hotel. And the hotel's locked down, you know, there's only us in there. And it's quite late and I'm sitting down, I'm doing something and somebody comes up behind me and says, uh, 
oh, they told me uh, that you worked with Ali. What was he like? And I'd recognise the voice straight away. So I turned around and standing there, he's got a little gaggle of people with him. I said, well, sit down. I'll tell you. And of course, after I'd worked with Ali, it gave me tremendous confidence to be able to work with anybody in the world. About an hour goes by and constantly people come and say, well, you know what? Because you know with the Formula One drivers, their time is so, they've got five minutes to do this, yeah, five minutes to yeah, do that. Yeah, no, they yeah, can't yeah, suddenly yeah, go off yeah, and spend yeah, some, yeah. an hour talking to yeah, some guy. Yeah, you know, they can't yeah. do that. So he kept waving them away. And uh, so he gets up. He said, well, thank you. I said, that's really interesting. Oh, by the way, did that idea you got, he said, I like that idea. He said, I talked to Ron. He said, I'm going to override it. How, how will we do it? I said, well, look, I'll show you tomorrow. In the, in the, and I had it all down. I showed, I showed him the rig I'd built and this, and how it could be fitted, safe, it couldn't come off. The only thing that would happen is the, the camera could blow up. But that, yeah, but it's in a, it's in a, in a thing and, sat, and sat, and I said, you, I'll be by the side of the track, headphones on, you've got the headphones in the car as you go around, I'll tell you, okay, fire here, do this, do this. Do this. And once again, it's on film. You got into dance, which seems now to be a natural progression from movement in sport to movement in dance. Cameras have helped, you know, you, the techniques have helped you come into it. How important is modern dance to you within this ballet modern dance sort of um, world? Well, once I got, I got into it by default. Um, I, I, was always, I always liked to go to the dance because we lived in St. Martin's Lane, the Coliseum was across the road. And I got into it by, by chance because my editor at the time said to me, rang me up one day and said, our dance photographer is not very well. Would you, would you go and, and, and shoot, see how you get on? I said, well, I've never done it before, and I hadn't. He said, well, wing it, you know, just do what you can. So, so off I went, and uh, he rang me the next day. He's got three pictures in the papers. He said, you're unknown, <laughs> totally unknown, <laughs> which I was. Yeah. I was. Unknown in a new world. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, yeah, they, yeah. they didn't even know it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even look like them. Yeah, they yeah. got quite different. So, uh, yeah. do, you, do you fancy giving up the day job? <laughs> Shooting a sport? I said, well, no, but I like it. So that's how I got into it. Now, you were never part of the pack, the Fleet Street pack, or the group of photographers. And yet you are very gregarious. You love people. You get on well with people. You can talk to anybody. And you have done all around the world. But you work alone in your own practice is to work alone. How do you manage the two, you know, not being part of a group and yet still making these great photographs? As I said, when I first started, I was one of the photographers that was a supreme influence on my way of thinking was John Claridge. Great, just an extraordinary photographer. And he's, he gave me this great advice, which to this day resonates still in my mind. Remember. Leo, you're there for the people that can't be there. Make it work.